much of that could I get? You want the blood? I feel more alive than I have in years. Hey, Mrs. Fetter, you all right? I belong to a club that I didn't know I was a member of. This is my home. This horror is my home, and these are my people. I think they started with the parts that I had in my early career because even though I grew up watching shows like uh, Dark Shadows, I watched that show when I was about 11. And then I grew up also on Night Gallery and The Outer Limits, things like that. But I just always wanted to be an actress and illuminate the human condition. And it was never my, my thought that I was going to have a home in horror, but it was, it was after working with Stuart Gordon a few times. And then really, I'd say coming back with your next uh, a little over 10 years ago that I realized, oh, I belong to a club that I didn't know I was a member of. This is my home. This horror is my home and these are my people. And what I've come to realize about horror is that we deal with the basis of human emotions. We deal with fear. And fear is always an emotion that most of the time you run from. It's not like love or empathy or, although I think empathy is, is uh, inherently a component of, of horror. It's, but it, it comes out of trying to understand what horror is. And in horror, I feel like if you can really look your fears in the eye and even watch things unfold on screen and watch other people have the skills to, to combat whatever is coming at them, you as an audience member will feel stronger and braver for having done that. So I feel like or can offer a service to, to a viewer more than any other genre so that you know we, we are able to deal with our fears. So I've really come to appreciate what, what horror can do. Uh, fantastic. Um, I was really lucky to be cast in Reanimator and have the opportunity to work with, with him on probably, I guess, what people would call his seminal film, even though it's his first film and he has a big body of work. I think he's mostly remembered for that movie more than anything else. Stuart came from the theater as I did and also Jeffrey Combs and, and Bruce Abbott. And when we were about to go into production on that movie, uh, I hadn't done very much film work uh, up to that point. He asked us if we would rehearse. And so we, we all said, yeah, that's what we do in the theater. Why not? So we rehearsed that movie for three weeks before we shot it. And I thought, oh, this is how films get made. You know, you rehearse with your other actors and it's, you know, you get, you get to the set and then you just do it. I've never done that since. I've never had three weeks of rehearsal since then. And that's unfortunate. But I feel like that's one of the strongest components of that of that film is that all the beats are there. It's really a tight film. And the characterization of what Jeffrey Combs did with, with Herbert West was just like mind blowing. And just with Stuart Gordon really honing us all in on all our different parts. Some directors you work with are really in there with you and really talk to you a lot about the character and what they want to see on screen and how they want you to move. And some directors are a little bit more visual and work with the camera. Some directors don't really say much to at all that you show up on set and they, you do what you do. And then they put it together in the editing. Stuart, maybe because he came from the theater was a very heavy handed hands-on director. And I always say, if he could play every part he would and he could because he really understood the motivations of every character and every player. And, he worked very closely with Dennis Paoli, the writer for Reanimator and From Beyond and a lot of other movies that he did. So really from the very beginning, he's just, he's just, you know, he's an auteur and he's just so in there with the whole project. So um, I feel very fortunate that, that I was able to work with him on, on so many projects. A 
few years ago, I think 2015, um, a friend of mine, Bria Grant, who is an actress and director now, um, somebody asked her something about what she thought about being a scream queen and how she felt about that. And, and somebody mentioned it to her on Twitter. And then she said, well, I'm not really the person to ask about that. If you wanna ask what it feels like to be a scream queen, you should ask my friend, Barbara Crampton. So somebody was tweeting to me about that. And I sent out a tweet and I said, I feel like the term scream queen is a little bit old fashioned and antiquated and doesn't really characterize the depth of emotion and what an actress goes through on screen and what they're capable of doing. And I, and I feel like I just don't really want to be called that. And then some websites contacted me right away and said, would you write an article about that? And then I said, oh, okay, yes. And so I dove in and I wrote an article about it, and, you know, where the term came from. And I know that it's said with reverence and that people, you know, say it in a positive way towards the ladies of horror, but I also feel like it's a little bit reductive and it does, it just doesn't encapsulate the enormity of what women go through on screen just to reduce them to a term like screen queen. Like it just makes me think of this woman who's running for her life and needs to be saved. I just think um, we've moved past that and beyond that. And I feel like women in, in horror movies are really resilient and really strong and are survivors and are smart and cunning. I just think there's better ways of, of um, talking about women in horror than just reducing them to this moniker of Scream Queen. I'd say maybe I would look back at From Beyond and say, maybe that was the most complicated. It was a very early on in my career. It was a very heavy schedule for me. And we were shooting at the old Dino De Laurentiis studios in Rome. And I think he had gone bankrupt at that time. It was really freezing in the studio that we shot in because they took out all the heating elements in the walls to, to pay off some of the bankers. So it was really cold. <laughs> and um, we had to get heaters brought in just to, to keep it, you know, 55, 60 degrees. And there was this slime that we used in filming. Every time you went into the beyond, there was like just this, this watery sort of clear fluid that would appear all the time. That product was called methyl cellulose, which was the, which was a food thickener that they used a McDonald's milkshake. So it was really cold and gelatinous. That movie is actually dear to my heart and special in the way that it gave me the opportunity to play a lot of different kinds of emotions within the span of one movie. Because um, you know I was a psychiatrist and then very repressed. And then when you know my the pineal gland is, gland is um, stimulated, it sort of brought out some passion in my character and then she has to become a heroine and then she goes crazy at the end. So I had a lot of different things to play within the span of one movie. So I'd say that was for practical effects and psychological and emotional aspects. I think that was probably the most difficult and most challenging uh, role I've ever had. Well, everything's digital now, so it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit faster. I feel like it's not such a mystery anymore. It seems like anybody can make a movie if they want to pick up a camera or an iPhone or whatever. The biggest change, though, that I've seen over the years is that uh, I do feel like there's more women that have kind of come into their own in the filmmaking process over the years. Um, and also people in general can do almost any job. When, when I came up in the eighties, you kind of stayed in your, in your lane and you did what you did. I was an actress, but I never thought, oh, I could actually produce movies too, which I'm doing now. And directors now are also cinematographers and they're writers and they do their own editing. And I, I feel like in the eighties, everybody just kind of did their own job. 
and I would wait for the phone to ring. And now a lot of these filmmakers are putting things together on their own with their friends and trying to make content and, and just rising up in the ranks. I had the opportunity, as I mentioned, to work with um, Adam Wingard in Your Next and everybody on that movie was a hyphenate. Adam was able to edit and also um, occasionally while we were filming, he would grab the camera from our DP, Andrew Palermo, who was amazing, but he would say, oh, I, I see something interesting here that I wanna film. So he would grab the camera from Andrew and just start filming and he's the director. So I feel like today, the kids that are coming up are realizing <clears throat> that they have to kind of know how to do more than one job to be successful. And there's a lot of competition out there now. A lot of movies are being made and, and there's a lot of content. And so how do people hear about your movie and how do you rise to the top so that people know about you and you can get another job and maybe you can get a studio or somebody to, to fund you. I know it's different in France. And I, I think the government is better at subsidizing movies than, um, than we are here, you know, in America, it's roots. The, the first project that you put out has to be, has to be amazing, has to be really great so that you get, you continue to get more opportunities and more opportunities. So if you wanna have control over that, you need to learn how to do a lot of the jobs yourself. Well, uh, the screenplay won an award at a uh, film festival contest in Los Angeles at a film fest called Scream Fest. And the fest director there, Denise Gossett, and the original writer, Mark Steensland, reached out to me and said, oh, this would be a nice movie for Barbara Crampton. So I read the script and fell in love with it. Um, because not only have I always wanted to play a classic character like a vampire or something similar, but um, I really love the story because it was also about a marriage and a long-term marriage. And how do you keep that going after all the life has been sucked out of it? So I started going around to different production companies and talking to them about it. We found Travis Stevens. He had just directed The Girl on the Third Floor. I had worked with him before as a producer. He produced We Are Still Here. He read the script and loved it. And uh, I finally had a production company that was willing to take a chance on it as well. And then uh, we were able to film it. But that took, about, that took about three years of working on the script and finding the money, looking for the director and you know, everything else, it, it, it always takes longer than you think. It was actually really important when we were talking about who should play Jacob, that we find somebody who was a long time married person as, as I am. I've been married for 20 years and Larry's been married a little bit longer than that. I felt like I had a really good rapport with already and we really connected. I mean, he is my friend. So there was a shorthand that we had with one another going into filming. And um, we also really worked on uh, our relationship together in the way that um, we each sort of wrote down like a little story about our own relationships with our own spouses and how we related to them. Then we wrote up a little um, biography for our characters as well. And Right before filming, I'd say about a month before filming, Travis went back and he did some rewriting on the script and added some things in there that are uh, representative of the relationship that we had with our respective spouses. So there's a lot of us in the movie as well. And um, yeah, it was really, I, I feel like our chemistry was good in the film and I, I love Larry so much. So that was really helpful and probably one of the most important aspects to the film. I try to keep up on what's current. Um, right now, I'm watching a lot of series on TV as well, but horror series. Um, so uh, right now I just started Yellow Jackets um, and I'm really loving to see Christina Ricci on the screen again. And I think she's doing an amazing job. Yeah, Archive 81 I thought was really good, really tense and, and cool. You know, as, as we talk about horror and empathy, I mean, 
what was what stood out to me about that series was that it was pretty scary, at, but also it was about, about the characters. The characters became so important to me as I was watching them. And I really, I really liked them so much that I didn't want anything bad to happen to them. And so now somebody else is lost within that realm, that other sort of plane of being and has to be rescued. So I'm like, oh, darn it. <laughs> Gotta get him out of there. I have two movies that are coming out um, this month in America. One is called Alone With You, and uh, it was shot during the pandemic. The filmmakers filmed most of the movie in their own apartment in Brooklyn, New York. I play uh, the main character's mother. And so I had a few phone calls through Zoom with her. And this was at the height of the pandemic when it was really locked down and nobody was going out. They mailed me a camera. And then I had to set it up and I filmed myself. I was my own lighting designer and makeup artist and cinematographer and actress. So that was really fun. It's, it's a thriller. It's a very tight, scary thriller. And then I did a movie uh, with Ricky Bates Jr. He directed Excision and Trash Fire. Mm -hmm. It's called King Knight. And it's actually a comedy uh, with Matthew Gray Goobler uh, playing the head of a coven of witches and it's a movie about trying to find your true self and and who you are it's a really sweet lovely film and i play matthew craig Goodler's mother in the movie and we shot that before the pandemic so you know uh it's it's uh, wide open with a lot of um you know scenes with group scenes with people together and so anyway both in both of these films i play a character that is sort of an unforgiving, uh, uh, judgmental mother. So as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm playing a lot more complicated um, parts in that way. Mm -hmm.